By Iron and Blood is a game of the Battle of Königgrätz, July 3rd, 1866, part of the Austro-Prussian War. <clears throat> the Prussians are attacking a larger number of Austrian troops in front of the fortress of Königgrätz, but that's okay because the Prussians are counting on their superior maneuverability and training, and also they're counting on a second army to come and help them. But will the second army show up in time? That's one of the biggest big questions in the in the game, and it is modeled by using the Prussian second army arrival deck. And so you're gonna have your your troops, uh, the all the Austrian troops, uh, all the Austrian units on the map, part of the Prussian units on the map, and the end of each turn. The Prussian player will draw a card and will keep a running tally of, oh, that's very good, uh, turn after turn, uh, what is the total reinforcement number, and there is a table that will tell you when you get five, this this unit centers the board, when you get to seven, these are the units center the board, and so the reinforcements, the timing of the arrival of the reinforcements is unclear and variable. Speaking of cards, each player also has a unique deck of event cards that will trigger at different times, depending on what the event says. Some events <clears throat> have multiple uses you can choose from. And every card, every card also has a spontaneous fire event, meaning you can just discard one, ignore everything it says to get a fire attack during your activation. And so there is that, uh, there is that. Now, the game is clearly mainly two players, uh, for two players, I played it solo, two-handed, I had no problem, but then I also know that uh, not everybody may enjoy playing the game with all of the command chits visible, as you, and you'll see soon what that means, and also with the event cards all face up. But I did it, and I enjoyed the game, so, so be it. This is the map of the game, it is printed in uh, fake paper, really, I'm not disqualified as car stock. Um, it looks a little bit pale, I would say. Uh, the area of the confrontation is here, the Austrians will uh, set up here, the Prussians are coming from here, reinforcements from the second army are coming from there. And victory is based on, on victory points, uh, which are assigned for control of locations on the board. These locations with yellow dots are worth victory points for the Prussians and, or the Austrian, whoever is controlling it. Then you have these blue dots here, they're worth victory points only for the Prussian player, but they're worth a lot, so the Austrian player really wants to prevent that. And then we have instant uh, victory hexes. One is there and one is down here. If the Prussians ever take this hex, they win the game immediately, and if the Austrians ever take that hex, they win the game immediately. Which means, again, of course, that uh, you can try to outmaneuver the opponent who may try to do the same, but you don't want to thin your line too much because you don't want the opponent to march straight toward the victory, uh, the victory hex. The map, again, looks a bit pale and there is another problem that I wish that the hexes were a little bigger because uh, there, there were just several times when the board starts being a little bit busy that I just had no idea, and no idea if that is clear or if that is uh, it's forest. Uh, there is a town there which uh, is super important <laughs> for combat purposes. And so I constantly have to check, oh, no, there isn't a town there, not there. Oh, there it is, there it is. So I wish that the hexes were bigger and also that the terrain was coded not just by a piece of art in the middle of the hex, but simply by the edges so that even if just a little bit is sticky now, then I can tell anything there. Oh, there was a town there, I completely forgot. So, that is one thing that makes this map not particularly functional. Oh, the counters are here, so let's take a closer look, the counters. The fighting units belong to different formations, as indicated by the color band on top. Then we have artillery uh, attack points. 
Yes, all units have some, even those that are not specific artillery. Of course, they are fewer uh, attached guns. Then we have uh, the main strength points. And of course, artillery doesn't have a lot of those. Other units have more. The number of dots here is stacking points. Uh, two dots is the stacking limit. Bottom right corner is moving value. And here, top right corner, you have training, and training speaking, uh, quality, which will result in uh, modifiers during combat. Now, the game system uses a command system, which is very clever, and really this is the heart of the game, in my opinion. Each player has a play rate, such as this one, where they organize their command markers, and each player receives eight command points each turn, usually. Then players will alternate uh, taking turns, and when it is your turn, you issue a command to one of your units here, or one of your formations here, and the cost is indicated there. If I'm activating the guard right now, it costs me one command point. Activating the second core will cost me two command points. Suppose I decide to activate the guard, I spend that, I place it in the spent unit for the time being. Then I activate the guard units that are on the board, they do their thing. And then at the end of everything, well, then I just slide down these other markers here, like so. So I think you see what the, the trick here is here, so to speak. That is, if you sequence your units correctly, your formations correctly, you're going to activate a lot of them because you're always going to spend just one combat point for that. You also have a little bit of a flexibility because you have uh, uh, HQ markers. And so you can activate a unit in the same space as the HQ marker or adjacent to it, spend the corresponding amount of points, and then it is the HQ, not the unit that is placed in the spend. So basically, if I had done that to activate, to activate the first reserve core, and then next turn, I can activate it again. Well, usually once you activate it, it's bumped all the way back there. So the, the HQ markers give you a little bit of extra flexibility there. So you're going to try to respect the sequence as much as possible because it's more economic and more advantageous. But, oh, if we see the opportunity for a big attack, exploiting a gap, uh, some dairy maneuver, then you may consider spending more combat points and do it that way. And that is kind of the, the general idea. Once you have determined the formation you're activating and you have spent the command points, and then you gotta give them an order. You can't just have, send them out to do whatever they want. What is this? We're, we're talking about trained soldiers here. And so you can order, order them to march, to engage, to assault, or to regroup, one of these. As you can see, it will affect how many, uh, how much of their movement allowance they can use and also what they can do and in which phase of the turn because after the formation activation step, which is also when you can play a card to do the spontaneous fire, remember, to get that extra attack, then you had the fire, the movement, the assault, and the rally. And, well, fire... It's what it is, uh, and usually precedes, uh, it precedes movement. You may notice that. But the Prussians are very flexible and sneaky. They can, in the fire combat phase, move at half speed and attack at half strength if they so wish. Fire combat, then movement, then the assault, which is if the units have received a compatible order, they can move not just adjacent to the enemy, but into the same Hex is the enemy, and then they need to take a test to see if they're actually standing there or bouncing back. And if they have received the regroup order, then you check if they rally in the rally phase, which allows them to get rid of markers such as disrupted or shaken. Units also usually have two sides. And basically, when you have the cumulative effect of shaken, then disrupted, then disrupted again, the unit breaks, flip this way. Breaking also gives victory points to the opponent. So victory is assessed based on control of things on the axis, on the map, and also again, that. 
For combat, interesting enough, you have two different uh, two different types of combats: f combat, fire, and assault, and two different uh, player rates with different combat tables. So you're gonna have a Prussian assault combat and a Prussian fire, and then an Austrian combat uh, assault and and fire. Fire, you total the firing uh, strength points of the unit or units, apply modifiers uh, uh, in the form of column shifts, roll d66, a bit unusual, and then you apply the results, which can be <laughs> the enemy fires back at you, or nothing, or things happen like you shake them, you disrupt them, they can choose between being shaken or retreating. As for assault, well, this time is a differential between the assaulter and the target unit that will give you a column, again, important column shift, such as, such as the quality, they mentioned earlier, the quality of the training, so that's, uh, that's important, uh, that's why the, the, the factor comes into play. Once you have the correct column, again, roll D66, roll D66 cross-reference and apply the result and you have again this very detailed very nice player it will also tell you how the various combat results uh, stack up like if you're shaken and take another shaken uh, if you're disrupting take another shaken so after a while you just keep reading this and applying you know color by numbers until you don't need uh, the training wheels anymore it'll just be applying the results as they come so, the Prussians are moving and attacking and trying to inflict damage and take control of valuable victory hexes and also possibly dislodge the Austrians from some of those. The Austrians are trying to prevent the Prussians for, from controlling too many hexes and both are threatening and trying to protect at the same time the instant victory hexes. And this is the general idea of how you play by Iron and Blood. This is not a simple war game, definitely not a beginner's war game. So it's going to be for those of us who are already uh, practitioners of the hobby and you need to set aside a very long evening, maybe two. Uh, the back of the box I see now says here four hours. It definitely took me longer than that to play the game. I think each turn was about half an hour and there's 12 of them. So, uh, so you, you do the math. It, it's a long game, but it also has a very interesting, very cool narrative arc because... Because, well, you don't know when that army is going to arrive, the second army. And uh, that may change a lot of things because they can threaten uh, to take control of those blue dots. Uh, that, that was auto points <clears throat> for the Prussian player. They even threaten to go to Kroningrad. Maybe, meanwhile, another part of the Prussian army is threatening the other flank of the Austrian. They're, threatening, not encirclement, but just, you know, moving around and threatening Kaliningrad. But in so doing, you are thinning out your line and risking possibly counterattack that threatens your victory hex. But all these things take time. So there is a sense of, like, slow countdown because it's not going to happen in a turn that one of those second army forces is going to get to Kaliningrad. It's going to take turns and turns and hours of real time. But again, there is a palpable sense of very slow burning mountain tension and that is and that is pretty fun and a lot of the of the combat is not immediately brutal it's not immediately bloody it's gonna be shaken and so move back and then you're gonna hopefully rally them so there's gonna be pushing back and forth breaking a unit is worth a good amount of victory points but it's not that easy and that's why again you have a situation that will look fairly static and again it takes repeated uh, attacking and maneuvering and pushing and maybe using some card effects to achieve a breakthrough but the situation is constantly leading to that and in that, again, there is a sense of, 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 there's a narrative arc that develops, again, slowly, but, but surely. 
I definitely like the command system. I think it's really fun. I think it's really interesting. It does it does bring uh, cool, nice dilemmas because, well, I can activate other people at one combat point if I just wait. But what if by the time I can activate that uh, formation at one combat point, I miss some opportunity. And so sometimes, yeah, sometimes you will have a turn, at least for one player, that's going to be quick if they jump ahead uh, with a formation but um, and then that's again it's very it may be very rewarding so uh, it's a game that has a lot going on there's a lot of detail but I feel it's all worth it it really adds up to the thematic experience so you're gonna have chrome you have a topic which is not one of the most game the matter of fact is the first time I ever play a war game about this battle specifically so a lot of good things here uh, the production, again, the map, I think, well, I, I would have preferred the map to be bigger and therefore more practical, that's my main uh, concern. Uh, the units are made of wood, which makes them nice to manipulate, but also a little bit slippery, and so from time to time if you have two units and you have like a marker on top, that stack and many stacks are next to each other, that stack, those stacks can be a little bit unwieldy. So there are a couple of minor things here and there in the production that make gameplay, the logistics of gameplay not as smooth as maybe I would like them to be, but gameplay. Gameplay is fun and solid for the war gamer who doesn't mind investing some time in learning a rule book, which is pretty detailed, and again, then implementing a game which is fairly complex from the point of view of the logistics, but it also pays off in that in the complexity and detail of the experience. And this is my assessment of Buy Iron and Blood.